the Scarborough Board of Education workshop for tonight. Could I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftos? Here. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. Mr. Bennett? If you could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Tonight's workshop, um, we're going to start with Monique Culbertson um, talking about the new proposed K-5 report cards. Thank you so much. I'm not sure which mic I'm supposed to speak into, so someone I'm sure will let me know if they can't hear me. Uh, I have been um, waiting for this moment for how many years, Kelly? Maybe six, seven, eight years. We used to have our K-5 report cards electronic, um, but then we parted ways with that company. We went back to the old hand, entering the information for quite some time. Uh, so for the past, actually, three years, it has been literally under development. About June, when we were gearing up to go full bore, uh, our, the person who administrates our power school decided to retire. So that put a little um, blip in the radar. Um, and then the person supporting that person decided to move on. That put a little, another little hurdle in our plans. But uh, I do want to thank um, Don Beijin and his data team who helped out immensely in getting this launched and off the ground. Um, so I'm very excited to present to you our electronic report card for K-5. One of the pieces that will be most helpful for our teachers particularly is they'll be able to avoid rushing to that room in the office where all those paper cum files lie and looking up out of 20 to 22 file drawers of information their students' data on a previous year. So this makes it much more easily accessible, more efficient time where teachers can be working on planning of lessons as opposed to um, digging through piles of papers and folders. Uh, and I also have some other updates as well. So a couple highlights, you have um, a copy of the PowerPoint, but there's also a packet that you all have which gives you a full-size version of each of the sample report cards, uh, as well as a draft of a parent information brochure that will go home with the report cards when they go home on December 12th um, across all K-5 schools. So of note, this electronically generated um, report card was no additional cost. In the past, we paid for that service. We used our um, grade book, which is embedded within our student information system, Power, Teach uh, Power School. The grade book is called Power Teacher Pro. So these teachers are direct entering their final grades. So it's a start of getting um, approximately 100 staff persons used to using an electronic grade book as well, which they have never done before. Um, one thing that's different um, is that it's the same scale for everything, and that scale hasn't changed. It's beginning developing competence strong with pluses and minuses. Uh, one thing that is different, the guiding principles piece, you used to be on the front page, um, has been merged with the effort piece that was on the second page, and that has been merged into three categories and listed with the content areas and I'll go over those pieces with you as well. So that top is the front page of the primary report card, the bottom is the front page of Wentworth's report card. Pretty similar, and the teachers will not have to hand enter the names of students, uh, the students grade, the attendance, all of those pieces. Um, so they're very excited. It was one of the most fun trainings I ever did, listening to the teachers ooh and ah over the simplicity. Um, so the front page also has that message from parents, um, and then they'll have comments. Uh, one of the pieces is we'll have comments from all teachers um, of a student, whereas in the past we were limited by the space. Um, we've made sure we've limited the space so that we make sure we have comments from all teachers. Uh, the second page, we have the key, which has not changed at all. 
Uh, the reporting categories are still the same reporting categories that we've had in the past. They're just listed differently. The other piece of that is you'll notice those codes, those letters and numbers with the periods in between. Um, some people think that's common core reference. Some people are thinking it's referencing to state standards. It's none of those. It is the language that the computer needs to put that reporting category on the report card. This is version one. Um, in the middle school to high school, some people know that code because they look up those grades online. Um, but it's on the report in this first version. Those guiding principles and effort categories were merged into three called self, citizen, and work. Uh, and we have homeroom course. Um, one of the big pieces that had to be done on the back end of this report card was to put and roll um, uh, students into courses within our system and set up courses within our system because everything's attached to courses. And that was a little bit different. Um, so we have a homeroom course, and you'll notice this is the K2 report card. It says homeroom grade K, and this is Jillian Daigle's class, and you'll notice self, citizen, and work, and then the literacy, same reporting categories, and the math, same reporting categories, science, social studies, and the specialists as well. It's the same pieces. Uh, the course structure is a little bit different uh, for 3-5. Because the homeroom teacher at K2 teaches all the content areas, it'll fall under homeroom. But at 3-5, because different teachers might teach different math classes or reading and writing, we split literacy up into reading and writing. So for example, at 3-5, you'll see the homeroom. The homeroom teacher will provide feedback on self-citizen and work. Um, but you'll notice there's a math as separate from homeroom, science, social studies, and there would be a reading with the reading reporting categories and writing with the reporting categories listed there. The specials, the specialists, they have an additional, they're going to be doing more reporting because they're going to be reporting on art, but they're also going to be reporting mm. on self, citizen, and work. Uh, STEM is only 3-5, so there won't be a grade for STEM at 3-5. And world language, very excited. We're in our second year of having world language offered at Wentworth, but that is not yet graded at this point in time. So from those guiding principles to SEL, SEL is what we refer to as social emotional learning. So the on the progress report card, the language would be self, which includes self-awareness and self-management which is really around a student's self-awareness, their ability to manage emotions, they recognize their strengths, their ability to be confident about their strengths, control their impulses, um, motivate themselves, and work towards personal and academic goals. And that looks different at each grade level. The teachers will be working on developing what that looks like for each grade level and working with the students as well. Citizenship is around that social awareness piece, being able to um, empathize with others, understand other perspectives, understand why we have rules, but also there's relationship skills as part of being a good citizen, and that's about help having um, and maintaining healthy relationships, um, ability to communicate effectively, those sorts of things, as well as working well within a team. And then work, and this is where the effort piece merges with the social emotional um, learning skills, um, and the effort piece, it's about responsible decision making, making good choices, but also the ability to problem solve, take action and reflect and adjust and reflect on their actions. And again, de depending on the developmental level of the child, that can vary across the grade levels. And then it's really that the, what we used to call effort is really about preparing and engaging in and persevering with tasks and focusing to do that quality work. Let me can I ask you a question? Sure. Do, do you provide curriculum on on those different areas as well, or are they just graded in their core work? There's a lot of wonderful work going on in individual classrooms. One of my other updates is about a K through 12 social emotional learning steering committee, and I'll talk a little bit about that. There are curriculum pieces there, but we're going to be looking to expand that and provide some core resources across the boards. Um, and I'll give you some examples of what some of those pieces might look like. So the timeline, um, I've done two or three trainings. Um, the teachers are trained, they're working on the report cards now, and they're scheduled to be, you know, we do a verification process, uh, and they're scheduled to arrive home on December 12th. Questions about, yes. What, um, 
How involved have, have parents been in the development of this report card and, and what communication has gone to them um, in advance of it going home on the 12th? Um, unless the building principals have done some, there has not been a lot of parent involvement in this because um, there's only one significant change in terms of the guiding principles in the effort piece and we're just launching that. Um, the building principals have worked with their staff in terms of analyzing the old report card and what pieces they'd like to see shifted. So we used that feedback to make these changes. But the grade scale and those pieces are not changing at all. So it's really the bulk of the changes is in the format. We will be getting feedback. We haven't built that survey yet, but we will be working on getting feedback from parents as well as staff, um, as well as students. And, and then just my second question was, have, has this, has presumably this has been communicated to parents so they know that it's coming home on the 12th? I don't know. They know the timeline. Yeah. The timeline for the but not that it's a different Not that it's a different report card. card. Okay. Yeah, it's, this, it's the same gotcha. timeline. They're on a trimester schedule. Am I correct in assuming the biggest shift here, just to kind of summarize what you said, which was, which was very well said, by the way, is modality primarily going to an electronic report card as opposed to a paper one. Um, so on the very first slide, one question I wanted to ask for anyone at home or anyone in the audience that's listening is you said that there was no additional cost associated with this, but there was a cost associated with the previous electronic version. So is there a savings associated with this based on the type of electronic report card we used to have that people could be excited about? Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, and the reason why I'm hesitating is you're going to ask me what that number is, and I'd have to look that up. <laughs> I, yeah. It was quite some time no, ago. That's all right. I wasn't going to ask the number because I'm like, I don't want to, you know, we don't need an exact number. But I think a savings, any savings is good. Thank, Thank you. you. So I know that we've um, shifted to our newsletters going home electronically. But um, whenever there's <clears throat> communication sent home electronically, I always worry about the families that may not have um, ready access. So has that been communicated to, to families? Or, in conjunction with the newsletters and do we know that are or, or are there options and is that you know identified the, for people well this report card will be going home in paper form with the paper brochure it won't be going home electronically okay um, the information about um, that this is coming and when it's coming generally that is electronic but each of the buildings provide paper backup for those folks who don't have access to electronic okay. pieces So, I mean, so if I look at this example that you have for like grade K, it says, all it says is homeroom grade K with a comment. Is that after a page like this where it shows each category and the grade? No, the comments will be listed on the front side of the page. That sample doesn't have every single class because we would have had to go into every single teacher's account. Because the data is live, we weren't able to come up with a mock student. So we populated some grades for some courses. So they'll be, for all the courses that a student takes, there will be comments and they will be listed on the front page. On the back side will be the math, the literacy, art, music, all the other content areas and their grades for those content areas, which was also on the back side of the old report card. So I, I understand that you have to tell Power School that these are courses to be able to do this electronically, but it's not a language that parents or students or teachers are familiar with at that level. So yes. how do you, is there any way to mitigate that? I mean, like for me to have my home, my kid come home with a homeroom kindergarten category I'd be like what I don't know I'm like it's like a high school thing or a middle school thing yeah um, we um, just didn't have the time to make the shifts in that um, with the template that we were working in um, with the staffing resources that we had at that time again this is just version one um, we can look to either changing those course names to something differently or looking at suppressing those um, that information on that report um, and providing other information. And this is going to seem really silly, but 
Is there any way you can do line, lines across it? I don't know. Or we can to be able to read it easily. I know it's silly, but it's just for ease of. We can certainly look into that. I don't know if we could be ready to go for um, our deadline, um, but I can find out. Okay, so I just want to clarify, like, so these are not the only things you're going to see on, these are not the only categories you're going to see for your kids. You'll see all of the, um, you'll see the information or the grades, for lack of a better word, for all of the content areas and teachers that the ch your child works with. Does that make Right, but I mean, like for example, right now we get information, there's like maybe 20 different categories that her homeroom teacher fills out based on, you know, like math. So all of those categories are still the same. Yes. Still be filled out. Okay. Yes. It has, the way that the tardies the way that's being reported, is that different? Have we always had excused and unexcused? We mm -hmm. have, okay. Yes. Actually, I believe on the old report card, we actually had suspensions, but we eliminated that one. <laughs> so that is a change. Thank you very much. This was awesome. Thank you. I'm excited for the changes. Okay, so part two was a curriculum highlights. So I will just keep going if that's okay. Yes, please. As you know, uh, we have uh, district and building goals, and I want to just provide a little bit of an update, a quick update on those. Um, our first two district goals, one is really focused around uh, improving our processes for making decisions grounded in evidence. Um, and focused on student learning and promoting instructional equity. And that is permeating everything we do, those protocols and processes across all projects. The second goal we have is focused on, um, last year was focused on building collaboration skills. This year it's focused on assessment literacy. This year we implemented a new universal screener. We are required by law to have what's called a universal screener to identify students who potentially may be at risk of failure for reading mathematics and or in the area of behaviors. Our new universal screener um, is called iReady from Curriculum Associates. We've provided trainings in August and early September so that all staff who would be implementing knew how to get good data. The training is called how to get good data, getting good data. Um, but we've also had training this fall after the initial round of assessments took place um, where teachers focused on and the consultants came in and worked with our teachers on, okay, now what? You have this data. Um, it, they helped um, the teachers learn how to interpret the data, but also how to use the data to improve instruction. We are this year piloting an, a, a component associated with the diagnostic assessment, and that's an online instruction piece. And what that online instruction piece does, it's an option for teachers, and we're gathering some information on that to see how effective that is. Um, it allows the um, student to enrich wherever they are, but also to work on some areas that they may not be, um, and it targets right at their instructional level. It's rather automatic that way, but the teacher gets all sorts of information about that, or the teacher can set up lessons or instructional activities. Along and so that, we're piloting that this year, the other piece that they have as part of this assessment is when the teacher sees the results, there are also offline activities and strategies that <clears throat> teachers can use to target the instruction at that particular level. There's also the, the software also allows groupings based on what the um, students need to focus on, what, which are called instructional groupings. So the feedback, the initial feedback from teachers is very positive. Um, they struggled with the amount of time testing but they, once they saw the results and the depth of the results and the information, the feedback as I sat in on the training was, yeah, this is pretty much aligns with what I'm seeing in the classroom, which is what we wanted to hear from teachers as well. Those parent reports, because that's an, it's a screening tool, those parent reports, which will have the fall, the winter, and the spring results, and parents will also be able to see growth, those will go home in the spring. 
Uh, our focus areas, while we have district goals and the building goals were built around our focus areas and they vary at different phase levels. The high school is working in the area of curriculum consistency in terms of building that curriculum guide. Um, other phase levels are working on writing, continue to work on writing. We have a K-12 group working on absenteeism and truancy. Uh, and the reporting and communication, clearly this is one step in that process, the K-5 report card. So those were the areas that we are focusing on as a result of the data as part of that comprehensive needs assessment that we've done in the past. Our challenge with that process is that um, while the state requires us to have annual goals, in order to really assess our progress, we need more than a year. <laughs> in order to reset our goals if we really want to do it well. So Kathy Terrell, improvement strategist, and I are working on that timeline to try and adjust that timeline so it makes more sense and we really are making decisions based on the data. A little main state assessment update. I was at a meeting just this week. Uh, the public, public release of that data um, will happen about January, sometime in January is what I heard. Um, <clears throat> they are not going to be issuing that data on the portal that they've used in the past. Part of this is around the ESSA, the federal law, um, Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, the state needs to provide what we used to call report cards for each school district. Um, they have built or contracted with um, a company to provide that via what they're calling an ESSA dashboard. I'll be happy once that's public and there's all kinds of categories of information um, and depending on where we fall within um, those different categories we could be not on any tier tier one tier two or tier three which would um, allow us a whole lot of support from the state so the individual reports the student reports uh, we are working on downloading those and getting those printed and mailed and those will go home um, about December 12th as well so they'll probably come with the K-5 report cards, middle school and high school, they'll probably come in the mail. Let me, is yes. this the same ESSA data that we've been waiting for for like almost Ever? a year? <laughs> yes. So, okay. I mean, <laughs> do you know what the, I mean, and obviously it's not us. Yeah, it's this, the state achievement data is one piece of the ESSA report around the yeah. schools, but absenteeism and truancy is another piece of data. Um, so it, what happened was that the state wanted to renegotiate the agreement with the federal government, and so they've renegotiated and revised some of the gotta do's that the state has to do in order to put this information out. Um, what we learned through No Child Left Behind was that one size fits all states doesn't work with that adequate yearly progress piece in those report cards and that sort of gotcha system. So the good news in terms of this dashboard is it is a little friendlier to a state um, whose profile is similar to Maine. We have a K-12 social emotional learning steering committee. Um, we have subcommittees at each phase level. We've met um, on October 23rd. We have another meeting scheduled for December 5th, I believe. But one of the things that we did was we started building action plans for each phase level. And our charge as a K-12 group is to utilize research-based strategies to build and implement a K-12 through vertically articulated um, plan to ensure that all students have that guaranteed and viable social-emotional learning. So the K-5 may be a little bit ahead of the game. They had a K-5 committee last year. Um, as a result of the time during PLT time, teachers have been working on strategies. For example, we have some teachers using yoga in the classroom. We have some teachers working on mindfulness. They've been trained in mindfulness with schools and they're working on that. We have all kinds of different things going on. We have the zones of regulation. We have, um, oh my goodness, uh, what are some others they have? the team building pieces, responsive classroom, those teachers trained in responsive classrooms, some of those strategies apply here. So we have a lot of good things happening. We've got to come together. K-5 has done a bit of a needs assessment um, and teachers want training. They want to expand their toolbox in helping to support and grow students in these areas. So K-12, one of our first tasks is really to develop and take a look at where are our kids. 
So we're looking at different tools, survey tools, um, where we would survey students, parents, teachers, on, to get a gauge mm -hmm. on where our students are and what their needs are in this area. We are relying on CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, which is a research-based organization. They have a wonderful website, and I'm happy to talk more. I could talk for hours on this piece. But basically, that framework is a CASEL framework, which articulates or helps describe what social-emotional learning is and categorizes it in certain areas so that we can target either our assessment or our learning to those areas for students. So we're working right now on a common definition and building awareness about um, not only the need, but what our planning is around this area. Do questions about the social emotional learning piece focus? It surfaced across the board as the highest priority across all buildings. So that's why we're taking a K through 12 approach on it. <coughs> Content area updates. You may or may not have heard that both science and social studies were, um, the, their state standards were revised and adopted. Science um, is based on the um, national standards, the NGSS standards. Um, social studies is based on some national pieces. Um, they took the old learning results and they updated them. Um, all wonderful shifts and changes. There have been a couple of DOE meetings and a couple of workshops. We've had teacher leaders participate in those workshops. And I'm going to be establishing some curriculum work groups to take a look at our standards. Science, I don't know that we're going to have too many changes in terms of our standards or targets. K-5 needs some work in terms of upgrading some materials and equipment and kits and things. Um, <clears throat> uh, and in social studies, we will have K-12 work. We will need to take a look at our standards and our targets in social studies, so there may be more that we need to do in that area. Um, K-5, because we have these eight content areas and most of the teachers teach all eight of them. We're looking to build some interdisciplinary units, some problem-based learning experiences for students um, so that it is an integrated interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary experience for our kids. In mathematics, there is a revised version of our curriculum, Math in Focus. They've taken feedback over the years. They've looked at student performance. They've made some adjustments in that. One of, and so that may have budget implications, and they've also adjusted the middle school program as well. That may have some budget implications moving forward. Um, many of these programs now have online applications connected to them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the issue of Flash. We're not sure that the online um, supplemental materials and student resources will be available next year. So in some respects, we are somewhat being forced into this. Um, <coughs> I've negotiated continued access to these online applications um, at a savings of a whole lot of money, like $25,000 plus, because it's glitchy, it's based in Flash, and it's going to be outdated. Um, so we have um, essentially no cost access this year, but this will be the last year. Um, so just a heads up on that. In terms of literacy, we're continuing on with units of study and reading and writing and word knowledge as well. We're tracking the reading and we're tracking um, the writing as well. Um, we're also taking a close look at dyslexia. Um, we had a subgroup go attend a conference on that and we have a group um, of parents um, that I've been meeting with who've been interested in um, seeing what we're doing. We also have a um, state law which requires us to screen for dyslexia. We have some improvements to, we have some improvements that we need to make in that area. So our instructional coaches are looking closely at our data, our screening tools, and using what they've learned from this workshop. Um, we're also connecting with the Dyslexia Center in Portland um, and tapping into that expertise to help us out in this process. Um, of um, taking a look not only of our screening, but also raising awareness of our staff, as well as providing some professional, de we will be planning to provide some professional development to our staff in this area, not only on how to support students, but also in terms of our interventions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. World language, we are still rebuilding. We are, excitingly so, in the second year of offering world language at Wentworth School. 
Um, middle school and high school have been in collaboration on a number of pieces in terms of student expectations, but also um, the middle school, we um, started out this year with some new curriculum materials that both the middle school and the high school will be using consistently. So they have been working together in a PLT during that late start time to work together on what does the middle school do, where does the high school pick up, what are the common benchmark assessments we're going to have, both at middle school and high school, and what those performance expectations are. So those conversations are going on um, every PLT day as well as in between. Uh, the high school, some exciting news there. Maine offers a seal of biliteracy. If you look it up on the DOE webpage, basically it is a sticker to go on the diploma, but also some notation on the transcript. And the state has articulated what, um, what either assessments or portfolio or transcript reviews need to happen in order to document that you have reached a level of biliteracy in one or more, in two languages. Uh, and the high school world languages, um, the department head there, Brianna Kelman, is working with AP Spanish this year to offer it to the AP Spanish students. Just had a meeting last week and brought the ESL teacher in, guidance and placement in, to have a conversation that if we are offering this to our students who are English speaking, but learning a, a second language other than English, that's great, but we also need to be open and um, offer this award opportunity to all of our students, our students who are in the ESL program, and that teacher is going to be working with our students there um, and, and looking at the criteria and offering that option, as well as our um, placement person is going to also screen. She already does screen when she screens and works with all juniors about how many languages they may be, they may know, and then um, go through the process. So this might be an award we can grant students, and it would be permanent on their transcript um, Monique, through the state of Maine. Yes. Is this consistent with the badging initiative that's being led at the Maine Department of Education? I know we're seeing it at the higher ed level, but it sounds very similar to that. Yes, it, it would fall okay. in that sort of that category Great. of pieces. Um, and uh, to the DOE's credit, their site is very um, helpful. It's constantly being updated on this. And uh, a special thanks to Brianna Kelman for doing all the legwork on this and making that happen um, for our students. <clears throat> Just out of curiosity, is American Sign Language considered another language? It is considered another language. I don't know where it falls on that list, though. Uh, there is a, um, an option um, for some languages, for example, some Native American languages of which there isn't an assessment in order to document or show proof of literacy in those areas. So there may be something for sign language, I don't know specifically. Instructional technology, as uh, you folks know <laughs> from previous presentations, much of our curriculum materials are um, moving to an online environment. We screen those to make sure it's not just nice and um, cool thing to do, but that it really does help students learn more or better. Uh, the flash issue has been around for several years. We've been working very hard at trying to find out all the different software and applications that teachers are using um, and those on, who we have a subscription with and some of the free software to make sure that um, when it sunsets in December 2020 that we are um, uh, not caught short on that. So there may be some possible budget implications on that. We are also looking for free workarounds as well. Um, also, as you may or may not know, we take our student data privacy piece very seriously. We contract with a service called Ed Framework where they scan, they use AI technology to scan the student data privacy agreements and scan the terms of service agreements. And they use the Connecticut standards for student data privacy, which are quite rigorous. And they come back and it gives you a score in terms of your student data risk. <coughs> so we've been running that through all of our software and making decisions as to whether or not the software is going to continue to be used in the district. Um, the good news is um, most of our um, software ranks in the um, three and a half on up. So um, we have not um, put our students at great risk in terms of the data piece. We've made good decisions along the way. 
We also are involved in the Maine Student Data Privacy Alliance, which is a statewide initiative in order to, and they have come up with agreements that we can send to software vendors. We're asking them to sign certain agreements to meet certain standards for data privacy, and we're continuing to also do that and post that as well. And that is, uh, yes, I just wanted to fill you in on that. That is a big part of the work that I do with the IT department. Other activities we're involved in, um, of special note, our leadership team, our subgroup of our leadership team is participating in a leadership academy. This is from the um, Greater Sebago Education Alliance in order to support continued growth for, for our leaders. Um, our team is focusing on response to intervention, those comprehensive student support services like academic support. Um, and they're taking a systemic perspective. So right now what they're doing is they're identifying the data they need to gather in order to identify where we're doing well, what improvements might need to make, be made, and so they're gonna be working on that. And this is a three-year initiative, it's a, so it's a long-term investment in leadership, but it's also going to benefit our students as we have an improved, more comprehensive student support system in place for students. And lastly, um, as you know, we have a Scarborough School Business Partnership. I was very excited um, to share that we have actually launched a website. Uh, and it is, this is a snippet from our uh, homepage. And there is a link, if you want to take a look at the partnership website, right in there, right underneath the Scarborough Education Foundation link. Um, and that can take you right to that website um, that co-chair Karen Martin and I have been working on over time um, to build a process by which if a business is interested in becoming involved in the schools, they can go into that website to get more information and learn how to contact us um, and we start that communication to try and build partnerships. And that is the nickel tour through the updates. Questions? I always have to turn this back on. Um, so for those at home that are watching my facial expressions, you notice that I smiled inwardly through that entire presentation. And the reason is that I live and breathe the climate that you're describing in your everyday in my professional life. And I just got through a Nechi visit, which is the higher ed version of NEASC. And the climate of assessment is omnipresent in almost everything they say. It's all across education. And I think as a district, we should be so proud that both of our goals, and I wrote hooray next to both of them, or hoorah, one or the other. And it's because both of them focus on moving toward evidence-based decision-making and movement as opposed to assumption-based, which is traditional academia and traditional education. So I think as a district, we should be so proud that we're so overtly embracing this. Um, and for everyone at home, this is something that's, that's really, um, it's all across the nation, it's all across Khan Academy, it's everywhere in education, both formal and informal, so you and, and everyone should be commended for this work, because to embrace it like this is something that I don't see very often in education, so it's, it's good work. Thank you, and I will say that with the addition of the position of the improvement strategist, that has made it possible. We've been able to launch a data analytics tool within our school district, and we're working on building um, more and more information within that system so that folks can have access to the data in order to make those decisions. And we work on the processes to make good decisions using that data. Excellent. Thank, again, thank you so much. Thank this you so much. Outstanding. If you have any questions or think of anything, you know where to find me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Benita. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 5.0, an adjournment to the workshop. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Fantastic. We'll be back in about 15 minutes. Thank you.